Reno, Nevada, 2008. The ground starts shaking and doesn't stop. Days turn into weeks. Weeks become months. But the tremors won't cease. Reno 911. We go someplace. Where's the site? For most of 2008, the city and its suburbs are under siege from below. Of course, everyone wants to know, will this earthquake pattern continue? Then, just as mysteriously as they arrive, the earthquakes disappear. But what's causing them, and will they return? The hunt is on to find the answers before the swarm strikes again. In March 2008, scientists at the Nevada Seismological Laboratory are grappling with an invisible threat to the city of Reno. A swarm of earthquakes has been assaulting Reno's suburbs for a month. There were earthquakes occurring every day, uh, earthquakes of magnitude 1 and occasionally a magnitude 3. The earthquakes were increasing in size, they were increasing in frequency, and the question began to play in people's minds, what's next? Again and again, the world has witnessed the unbelievable power earthquakes can unleash without warning. L'Aquila, Italy, 2009. A magnitude 6.3 earthquake rocks much of the country. Hundreds die. Tens of thousands left homeless. Sichuan, China, 2008. A magnitude 7.9 quake destroys more than 5 million buildings. The death toll exceeds 87,000. Northern Sumatra, 2004. One of the largest earthquakes ever measured, a 9.1, kills more than 227,000. In 2008, scientists in Nevada are faced with a terrifying prospect. The city of Reno may be headed for similar devastation. That was our fear that this could turn into a magnitude 6 or, or even a larger earthquake. In February, when residents of the Reno suburb of Mogul are caught off guard by the rumbling of a magnitude 2.2 earthquake. Maybe a pulse. Scientists initially don't believe this single small quake is a cause for concern. But in the days that follow, more small earthquakes hit just outside Reno. Because they were happening every every second or third day, we began to notice within a few days that this was being persistent. And that made it unusual. So within maybe a week, it was on our radar that uh, we need to keep an eye on this. In a normal earthquake sequence, a quake is typically followed by aftershocks of diminishing strength. But on March 8th, one of the earthquakes suddenly jumps above magnitude three. So threes are a lot bigger. And magnitude three is 30 times the kick of a magnitude two. A magnitude three is about the size of a football field rupturing in the earth. All of Reno would commonly feel a magnitude three. The quake passes in just seconds before doing much damage. But the escalating quakes now have everyone on edge. Reno 911, please fire medical. This, this house has been shaking and just about shook me out of the bed every day this week. The earthquakes were occurring right under two uh, bedroom communities to Reno. Mogul, which is about 1,500 people, and Somerset, a little bit newer community, which was also about 1,500 people. So there's a big population base that could be affected by the earthquakes. And neither one of those locations are, you know, were on our list of places that we thought were high hazard for earthquake. Scientists hope that the magnitude 3 quake is a sign that the days of tremors might soon be over. We began to realize that, hey, these small earthquakes are building up in what we would call a foreshock sequence, building up to this magnitude 3. Our hope was that, that this was going to be the main event. But the following week, another magnitude 3 quake strikes. Nine days later, there's another. Only two days after that, a fourth. And all the while, lab instruments are recording hundreds more micro-earthquakes too small to be felt. There's a dawning realization that something strange is happening on the outskirts of Reno. Have you been feeling these earthquakes out here? Yes, I certainly have, and they felt stronger than 3.0. At this point, we know 
we have something that's unusual on our hands. The, this puts it in a category of things that we call seismic swarms. A swarm is not a well-defined term, but I mean, generally speaking, you have a long, low intensity level activity. Seismologists have been tracking the daily number of earthquakes since the swarm began four weeks ago. Desperate for clues, they plot them onto a graph for analysis. The upper red line is the number of earthquakes of magnitude one or greater. At first, we have an earthquake every day or two, but by early March, you begin to see something of a pattern. You'll see a flurry of earthquakes, and then it backs off. But it picked up again, and there was a lull, and it picked up again, and there was a lull, and it picked up again. What seems like a month of random quaking instead reveals itself as a steady rate of activity. And it's accelerating. There was plainly an acceleration in the, in the, if you will, in the daily rate. And this indicated a higher degree of activity to us. It became fairly clear early on that it wasn't going to go away uh, right away, certainly. And all of us were holding our breath, waiting that the earthquakes would stop and we could be done. Seismologists struggle to understand the mysterious underground forces amassing against Reno's suburbs. Dr. John Anderson is the director of the Nevada Seismological Laboratory. To monitor the shaking, he and his team decide to deploy extra instruments in the affected towns. We could see events happening, but we didn't have any uh, station right there. Plus, we didn't really know the depths of the earthquakes. So what you really want to have is you want to have a station as close to the events as possible. Dr. Anderson chooses his own backyard for their initial deployment. Okay, so let's put it up on the hillside over there, okay? okay so. That's because he lives right in the heart of the town the swarm has targeted. My wife was feeling earthquakes daily. There had probably been a hundred earthquakes that were large enough that they had been felt. And that's a lot of earthquakes. They would just be a little shake. It would be over in less than a second. Whatever is going on here, we need to learn as much as we can. The team deploys state-of-the-art seismographs capable of detecting even the tiniest earthquakes. Well, this instrument is very sensitive. It, uh, actually, we are in Nevada, but we are capable of uh, uh, recording uh, ocean waves crashing into the shores in California. The instruments will record seismic waves, shock waves that ripple through the Earth's crust after an earthquake. That breaking of rock, the, the two sides moving past each other makes a lot of vibrations that go out, and those are the, the waves we feel at the Earth's surface. The fastest kind of seismic wave is called a primary, or P wave. This compression wave pushes and pulls the Earth as it moves through it. The P wave is followed by a secondary, or S wave, which rocks the Earth perpendicular to the direction it travels. Because S waves always travel slower than P waves, timing the waves allows seismologists to pinpoint an earthquake's point of origin. This is like a fast runner and a slow runner. And the farther away they go, the farther ahead the fast guy is. But with a little bit of algebra, you can tell, well, where, running time backwards, where could they have been at the same place at the same time? And they meet somewhere, and this is fundamentally how all earthquakes are located. The closer together the waves are when they reach a seismograph, the closer the source of the quake is. Once the lab's instruments are up and running, scientists will be able to pinpoint precisely where the swarm is coming from. We install these instruments by digging a hole and burying them. The, the reason we bury them is to have good contact with the ground, so when there's an earthquake, the instrument moves with the ground. In order to install them correctly, we have to level the instrument. So we level them by putting a concrete block at, and level that concrete block, and then we put the instrument in there. Once in place, they ready a second instrument, calibrated for larger earthquakes. We don't want to miss something. Anytime we miss getting records from a large earthquake, in a sense it's sort of a missed opportunity. We want to get as much data as we can, as fast as we can, to help understand our seismic hazards. We didn't know when we put these instruments out if a big earthquake would happen. 
but we were confident that we were going to get some interesting data from this. As scientists wait for the data to come in, Reno's residents anxiously wait for answers. It's clear that something dangerous is developing beneath their homes. There's one a week at least, and we had three this weekend. I, it's really scary. I don't know. It makes you wonder what's going to happen next. As the earthquakes continue through the end of March, dread grips Reno's residents. They fear their homes are directly in the sights of bigger, more damaging quakes yet to strike. And they're right. When the next quakes strike Reno in March 2008, the equipment buried in John Anderson's backyard records only fractions of a second in between the different seismic waves. That means the director of the seismology lab lives on top of ground zero. Seismologists take the data being relayed from Reno's suburbs and create an interactive 3D model of the swarm. It provides a 360-degree view of the quakes and reveals how deep underground the Earth is shifting. The data gives scientists even more cause for alarm. The quakes are surprisingly close to the surface. It surely made sense why everybody was feeling them because it was so shallow. The extent of the sequence goes down to about five to six kilometers. That's about the bottom of it. Uh, all the actions above shallower than six kilometers. And that's unusual in here because most of the earthquakes in this region are actually concentrated from about five to about 15 kilometers. Around this area, I can't recall an earthquake sequence of such a shallow nature. Residents are now confronted with the knowledge that the escalating earthquakes are directly under their homes and very close to the surface. It's like being near a bomb or a hand grenade. If you release a lot of energy shallow, then um, it's basically right under people's homes. The discovery only amplifies the anxiety over what could happen if a big quake hits. Part of the anxiety really here is that we are without a guide, as it were. It's unprecedented, and one never knows where an unprecedented thing will go. Begin to call your friends and say, have you guys seen anything like this? Scientists race to uncover Mother Nature's attack plan before she launches another strike. They start with what they already know about the forces brewing beneath them in Nevada. They try to match the area of the swarm's activity to maps of Nevada's fault lines. We live on a, a really dynamic Earth, and most of it is, is uh, very hot, uh, very mobile. Uh, we live on a very thin crust of frozen rock on this Earth, and the crust is broken up into a series of, of uh, they call them plates. They're, they're big pieces of the Earth that are all moving the same direction. Um, and it turns out that we're not far from the boundary of two of these plates in Nevada. Uh, the two plates would be the Pacific plate that goes from San Francisco to uh, Japan um, and the North American plate that goes from San Francisco more or less all the way to Iceland. Most earthquakes occur along places where the Earth's crust has cracked and shifted and grinds against itself, called fault lines. Typically that fault is stuck at the surface, so as the plates are moving, the stress is building up and building up and building up, and after hundreds or thousands of years, finally it, it ruptures, and that causes an earthquake. One side slips one way, the other side slips the other way. And uh, that sudden slip generates a seismic wave. It's not a straight line between the two plates as drawn in atlases or textbooks. It is, in fact, a fault zone, and this fault zone uh, is almost two states wide, all of California and half of Nevada. Nevada's crust is cracked and broken by thousands of faults, each one a potential earthquake waiting to strike. We consider a fault active if it had an earthquake in the last million years or so. Knowing where these faults are is very important because this tells us where the location of future earthquakes might be. And we just produced this map last year uh, showing all the quaternary faults, that is, faults that have moved in the last 1.8 million years or younger. There's tens of thousands of faults on this map, um, and any of these could be a candidate for a future earthquake. The faults exist across the state, one side to the other, the top to the bottom, uh, but we do have a particular concentration of faults in the western part of the state where the Mughal sequence occurred. 
But when they zero in on the area directly beneath Reno's suburbs, the maps show no known faults where the earthquakes are striking. Without a previously mapped fault to point to, geologists are left without an obvious culprit behind the steadily increasing swarm. But it also gives scientists hope that Reno may yet escape disaster. The fact that there was no known fault in a way was an encouragement because largest earthquakes happen on the largest faults. When a fault in the Earth slips, the size of the earthquake that results is determined by three main factors. One is how long the fault is. Another is, is how deep the fault penetrates into the Earth. And the third is, is how far the fault slips during the earthquake. So if the slip is very short, um, you can have a 100-kilometer long fault that slips only a centimeter, and that would be a relatively small earthquake. But if it slipped 10 meters, then that would be a large earthquake. Uh, so the, the size of the earthquake scales with the amount of slip that occurs. With no fault at all, then we don't expect it to mature into something genuinely large and seriously damaging. But maps of the geologic fault pattern are in constant flux as the Earth changes. The swarm may be caused by an old dormant fault that has gone undetected until now, or perhaps by something else entirely. It's possible that this earthquake is related to a brand new fault uh, that we haven't mapped before. As March turns into April and the earthquakes persist, Reno's residents and scientists nervously watch and wait. But as they pray for the quakes to die down, the swarm is just getting ready to unleash its full fury on Reno. By the middle of April 2008, a steady stream of earthquakes has been threatening families in Reno's usually quiet suburbs for almost two months. There have been 14 small earthquakes in this area since April 1st. And while that's not unusual, what is a little bit strange is that we've been feeling so many of them. Some quakes shake longer, others shake harder, but the rumbling beneath homes persists. And what was of concern was that people become numb to the threat after a period of time because it started to become almost a routine in their lives. But on April 15th, the swarm drastically breaks from its routine. April 15th, the, the swarm changed character. It began the morning with a magnitude 3 that caught our attention. Later that same afternoon, three more quakes, all in the magnitude 3 range, strike within only seven minutes of each other. This is another way to look at the data, and this is, a, this is in 24-hour blocks, and each one of these lines is, is, is one hour's worth of data. This is the activity on the 14th. Things appear almost to be getting quieter, although we're still having a number of small earthquakes. But the following day, this is the first magnitude 3 early in the morning, and here's a succession of three magnitude three earthquakes later in the afternoon. Scientists believe this escalation may be a warning that the swarm is evolving into something more dangerous. So we clearly we're picking up the activity here. This is the signal that things have changed. We didn't like changes, changes were bad. I definitely had a pretty good feeling of dread when the three threes came through in, in pretty rapid succession there. In just a single day, the swarm releases as much energy as it has in all of the previous six weeks combined. We began to pour over data, any kind of data. And I think if you look at the graphs, you can see that it's as if a runaway sequence was trying to get going. The story changes dramatically, and you can see immediately this rate, that rate are different. Plainly, it's accelerating. We're talking most of 50 earthquakes here in a day, or to an hour. This is different behavior than we've seen before, and really unprecedented. Scientists are concerned that the swarm is gearing itself up to unleash even larger quakes. At that point, I felt strongly motivated to communicate that to the emergency responders and called emergency management. And I remember how I began the conversation. I just said, I don't know what to say. <laughs> because we had no protocol whatsoever for calling an emergency manager and communicating that this could look like a foreshock sequence and we may have to be prepared for something larger. Reno's emergency responders must determine how to quickly prepare a city of more than 200,000 people for a potential catastrophe. We had to strike a balance between uh, preparing people, uh, but without alarming them unnecessarily. 
have your emergency kit ready uh, should you need to move out of your house or live for several days without power. We're trying to coordinate with emergency management people as well as the television. The governor and emergency officials are also expected to emphasize the importance of individual homeowner preparedness. Trying to um, organize um, press conferences because we've never done this before as a city to prepare people for a potentially large earthquake. The four stronger quakes of April 15th marked the start of a dramatic second phase in the swarm's pattern. Quakes that had been striking roughly every three days now start attacking roughly three times each day. April 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And for a while, you expect that. You expect after a magnitude threes, we're going to have aftershocks of magnitude two with one class. And so what you hope is that by, you know, 18th to 20th, 22nd, you'd, you'd really like to see it taper off. In our case, it didn't. So it means we're still heading up, <laughs> right? We're still increasing in magnitude over time. We have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, we don't know whether this is it or not. As Reno is pounded by more quakes each day, residents fear their biggest little city in the world is about to turn into a disaster zone. Months of sustained tension begin taking their toll on the community. There were examples of people that left and there were examples of people that actually put their homes up for sale. We did have a large uh, percentage of guests at a couple of our major hotels check out and decide to end their vacation you know, because of the earthquakes. Those residents and tourists who stay continue being tormented daily by numerous magnitude two and larger earthquakes. Although the damage is minimal, rumors start to fly of Reno's impending apocalypse. There was a strong rumor beginning that they could be volcanic in nature. Swarms are really common in areas of volcanic activity. For example, you have swarms of earthquakes in Hawaii. Yellowstone comes to mind. Nearby Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming sits above a supervolcano that blows its top approximately every 600,000 years. With molten rock or magma constantly churning underground, it's a hotbed of earthquake swarm activity. Thousands of quakes strike Yellowstone each year. And the public is, is aware swarms are associated with volcanism, and there was a lot of questions early on about, uh, well, is this a volcanic swarm? Some residents know that Reno's landscape is littered with volcanic rock. Lo and behold, if you look around in places, there are some volcanic flows at the surface. They're 10 million years old, but they are there. But scientists know that Reno's volcanic history is the ancient past. They dismiss an underground volcano as a possible explanation for Reno's troubles. There's no reason to suppose any of that's going on in the Mogul area. We recognize volcanic areas, and Mogul isn't one of them. And plus, none of this is deep. Volcanic earthquakes tend to originate deeper in the Earth, as magma pushes its way up through the crust to the surface. This sequence started shallow and stayed shallow, so there was nothing really below six or seven kilometers to suggest that it was connected to some kind of volcanic system at depth. With a volcano ruled out, scientists looked to other known causes of swarms for clues. There was some concern that these earthquakes could be man-made. There can be swarms associated with groundwater withdrawal at times. The pumping of groundwater for irrigation can lower an area's water table, creating a void in the earth that causes the ground to shift. But those conditions didn't exist in, in Mogul. We didn't have any deep wells that were going a half mile or deeper that could be uh, influencing these earthquakes. Introducing water into the earth's crust can also help an earthquake along. There have been seismic swarms caused in other parts of the world by people injecting water deep into the earth. In the earth, there's a lot of pressure. And it's holding these faults together. Uh, that's a normal stress that's, that's actually preventing a fault from slipping. Um, if you inject fluids into these cracks, it can somehow lubricate a fault plane and cause an earthquake to occur. Water injection is often connected to mining and drilling, but scientists know of no recent mining projects in Reno suburbs. So out the door, none of the things that cause earthquake swarms really fit the description 
Alarmed residents grow impatient to learn when the attack on their towns will finally end. What's going on? How large will this get? Uh, do we need to start evacuating schools? Should we be closing? Well, there's a lot of people that expected us to know what was going to be the next earthquake. That we Prepared for earthquakes, you can watch a special program that will air periodically. Those preparations will soon prove invaluable. The swarm is about to let loose its biggest attack on Reno yet. By the middle of April 2008, citizens of Reno, Nevada are desperate to know if the big one is about to strike their city. After months of earthquakes and with the swarm now intensifying, each additional quake has the potential to incite panic. Reno, the 911 system in our, in our country is a great concept. Unfortunately, in disasters, that works against us because everyone's first reaction is to pick up the telephone and dial 911. So immediately, the phones started lighting up. Reno 911, you need to respond? No. Reno 911. You know, this is something suspicious because quake People either wanted to report that they felt the earthquake, asking the dispatchers, did you just feel the earthquake? Yeah, we did, we did have a large earthquake. Oh, uh, should we go someplace? Or, uh, uh, where is it safe? And the concern is that people that are having a real life safety issue, their call won't go through uh, because people are trying to report the earthquake. As public safety officials struggle to keep citizens informed and calm, the assault on Reno continues to escalate. It's clear that this thing is not backing off. And this is a very dangerous state of affairs. It's ramping up to something. Scientists scramble to determine precisely where and how the ground in Reno is changing before the big one hits. A team of scientists hikes deep into Nevada's hills. They hope that advanced technology in outer space can help them understand what's happening miles underground on Earth. What we have here is a GPS receiver. It's the Global Positioning System. And it's very similar to the same GPS that many people have in their cars or could go on hikes with now. GPS is essentially a satellite system. There's a constellation of satellites spinning around the Earth, about 24 satellites. Essentially, the GPS satellites send a signal uh, which tells this receiver where the satellite was and when the signal was sent. Uh, and this receiver uses that information to infer the distance to the satellite. So during an earthquake, um, the ground can change its position uh, very subtly. And this, this motion of the ground will move uh, the instrument a little bit and change the distance uh, to the satellites. The next time the satellite sends its signal, it will take slightly more or less time to reach the receiver, depending on how the ground has shifted. This change in the ground after a quake is often imperceptible to the naked eye. But the GPS receiver is so precise that if its position changes by mere millimeters, it can detect the shift. And it's these very small changes uh, that the instrument can pick up, which we can use to infer what happened during the event. But scientists have had to wait until the swarm grew more threatening for the GPS technology to be effective. We usually need a much bigger earthquake before we can see displacements uh, in the surface. Um, so we really didn't think to do much uh, at the beginning of the swarm because the earthquakes were so small. But when activity rates jump in mid-April, they realize they can't afford to wait any longer. That's an indication that perhaps something bigger could happen uh, in the future. It really created a sense of urgency uh, for us to get GPS out uh, to try and measure what was going on. Around the 22nd of April, we got our instruments um, out around the swarm, uh, which turned out to be very fortunate because a couple days later, the intensity of the swarm really picked up. On April 24th, the swarm once again strengthens its assault. A magnitude 4.1, the largest quake to date, crashes into Reno at 3.47 p.m. Only eight minutes later, another one strikes. Well, the earthquake rate at that point takes off. I mean, it's very clear that, that we're not done yet. Five more quakes, magnitude 2.6 or larger, hit that day, continuously rattling homes throughout Reno. If you look at the number of earthquakes occurring, uh, they're just running off the chart. This is, this is April 15th. We thought that was a, a 
rocking rate of earthquakes. And this is even steeper. And we thought, man, we had problems here. Well, this is several times that rate. So now you're, you're really, you're talking several felt earthquakes per hour. And so this is, this is a, a very serious situation because we don't know where it's going at this point. What's the next step? You know, you're watching this, watching this earthquake sequence happen. Um, so what do we do? What are you going to do if there's a magnitude six? Most modern buildings are constructed to withstand a single magnitude six quake. But no one can predict if months of smaller quakes have already weakened the city. The question is, how many magnitude three earthquakes followed by magnitude four earthquakes? You know, what is the structural breaking point, the cumulative effect of smaller earthquakes? That we don't know, and that was a big concern. We had sent out of the strongest earthquake risk message we'd ever given in Nevada. Now is a great time for them to think about, am I ready for an earthquake? At that point, I think all we could do was just watch the situation. The next day, five more quakes of magnitude two or three target Reno suburbs throughout the day. Of course, everyone wants to know, will this earthquake pattern continue? Well, seismologists say right now, it's just too difficult to tell. Then, just before midnight, the biggest one yet, a magnitude five slams into the city. I live on the south side of Reno, and it shook me out of bed. Um, and immediately, of course, all the radios, all the telephones, all the 911 lines were lit up with people thinking, you know, that this was the big one. Reno 911, you need police fire ambulance. Hey, I'm in Northwest Reno. My walls are all cracked from this big earthquake just now. The energy equivalent of magnitude five is, is it's on the order of a small atom bomb. So, yikes. To have it be relatively shallow, it, it's, a, it's a crazy thing to have in a community. The shaking is strong, but the quake quickly subsides. Many homes suffer minor damage, but somehow most of Reno miraculously escapes unscathed. Scientists are even more puzzled when the data from the quake comes in. Ground motions were, were extremely high, uh, much higher than you'd expect for a magnitude 5 earthquake or, or what we'd expect the shaking was in the, in the Mogul area. The discovery only raises more questions about why such a strong, shallow quake didn't wreak more havoc on Reno. A good way to imagine what happens to a building during an earthquake is to remember what happens to us when we are in a vehicle and we suddenly slam on the brakes um, and are thrown forward. That's deceleration. Or if we floor the accelerator and we push back into the seat, that's acceleration. And if it's high enough, we can get whiplash. In an earthquake, buildings can't accelerate that quickly either. The building is at rest, the earthquake occurs, the ground accelerates, the building lags behind, and these uh, whiplash forces in buildings can be very, very damaging. Instruments like the one buried in John Anderson's backyard have been recording the ground accelerations throughout the swarm. According to their readings, the magnitude 5 quake should have produced strong enough whiplash effects to cause widespread damage. Generally speaking, there was no structural damage in Mogul, but there should have been. Uh, the first question that you get asked as a scientist, then it probably it's instrument error. We may not be using these instruments correctly. So a very quick way to, in fact, determine whether or not that's true is to, in fact, bring them into the laboratory and just be sure that we're getting the, the correct data. The University of Nevada, Reno's large-scale structures laboratory is home to four movable shake tables. These 14-square-foot platforms provide scientists with a way to simulate and study earthquakes in a controlled environment. This is one of our shake tables, and uh, it is driven by hydraulic actuators. The table moves on two rails, and um, because one rail can slide on the other, like this, the table can therefore move in any direction in this horizontal plane. Circles, ellipses, and of course, earthquakes. We can even amplify an earthquake. We can have larger earthquakes in the lab than are recorded in the field, which is often necessary to find out how things collapse. So in order to determine whether or not this instrument error, the accelerometers are brought into the lab, bolted down to one of the tables, and then subject to random uh, vibrations, but all the frequencies uh, that we see in an earthquake. 
The test proves that there isn't anything wrong with the instruments or the information they've collected. If the instruments don't have an error, then indeed the ground was moving during these earthquakes all throughout Mogul, very high accelerations. And so the question then remains, why wasn't there more widespread damage? A closer examination of the data provides scientists with a possible explanation. They suspect the duration of the magnitude 5 earthquake saved the city from greater ruin. In the Mogul sequence, the largest earthquake only lasted three seconds. The duration of strong shaking, only about three seconds. We have a building here, uh, which is rather like a house, in the sense that we have a basement, and we have a first floor and a second floor, and we have a roof. What, what we're going to do is we're going to recreate three seconds of the Mogul earthquake, so um, we can turn it on and see what happens. And that kind of motion is what many people reported they saw in their houses in Mogul during the earthquake swarm, that the upper floors swayed particularly and then stopped and the building was still standing. In a three-second earthquake, the building's only just begun to respond and the earthquake's gone. Now, truly damaging earthquakes, the ones that we saw in China last year, were like 30 seconds. Some even go to 50 and 60 seconds. A 20-second test illustrates the destructive effects longer-duration shakes can cause. And the, the result is obvious. We get total collapse of the building um, because of the fact that the ground shaking went on for a longer period of time and it was long enough for the building to, in fact, sway to the point of collapse. This gives us confidence in our postulation that, indeed, duration the shortness of duration in the case of the Mogul sequence was the reason for the lack of uh, widespread structural damage. But despite having dodged a bullet, the city of Reno is offered no respite in the wake of the magnitude 5. The quakes continue, and scientists are concerned that the swarm is only just entering a third, potentially catastrophic phase. We scaled up on April 15th, and then on the 24th, we scaled up again to another level of magnitude, and now on the 26th, we're at another new territory, a magnitude five. The earthquakes weren't dying away. They weren't turning into an aftershock sequence. They were just continuing. I think the period between April 25th and, and the end of April was the scariest of all for us. Residents brace themselves for the worst, and scientists barely have time to catch their breath before the swarm continues its onslaught. As Reno recovers from the magnitude 5 quake, no one can predict whether the swarm will continue to escalate. But having tracked the earthquakes for more than two months, scientists are able to detect an emerging pattern in its behavior. There's many, many earthquakes that were located, but we took the very highest quality locations and put them in a time sequence. In this animation, we can actually see how the thing progressed. And we can see in the early part of the sequence as it's confined to the Mogul and the southern Somerset area. There's the large, the main shock. And after the magnitude five, um, the, the sequence quickly extended to over eight kilometers long. As the pattern emerged, we have a nice, long, linear, uh, northwest striking structure. Faults are broken into categories depending on the angle and direction the Earth slips during a quake. In so-called dip-slip faults, one side of the Earth usually drops down or is thrust up over the other. And those give us the mountains and the valleys that we see across Nevada. But in strike-slip faults, one block of Earth slides past the other in a direction horizontal to the fault plane. The linear northwest pattern of the Reno quakes leads scientists to believe it's a strike-slip fault that's causing the swarm. This tells them that the forces ultimately driving the quakes are probably tied to the plate boundary on the west coast. As the Pacific plate moves to the north, it's grabbing the large block that's the Sierra Nevadas, and it's wrenching it to the north as well. And Nevada is feeling the influences of that wrenching to the north. If you plot this fault and you plot the direction that the Sierras are moving, they're almost parallel. And, and so um, it's hard to imagine the Sierra moving and this not somehow being related to that. For weeks after the magnitude 5, the swarm continues to shake Reno with more earthquakes. Fortunately, none are as powerful. 
But one possibility causing concern is that the spreading swarm could set off a chain reaction of larger earthquakes on other faults nearby. This close-up view shows the heart of Reno, and the, the Mogul sequence is off in the western side of Reno. There's a uh, fault zone which is just to the southeast of, of this activity. And um, we could see that some of the activity is getting very close to this fault zone. But scientists debate whether or not these larger faults pose an immediate threat to Reno. The potential danger is having larger earthquakes. If we get up to six miles, eight miles of faults that could fail, that's a magnitude six size earthquake, which would involve all of Reno. The swarm has already escalated from magnitude two quakes to a magnitude five. Residents fear the swarm has something even worse yet in store. But then, just as mysteriously as the swarm arrived, the quakes begin to disappear. I know we were all very relieved to see it begin to slow down. Scientists believe the worst may be over, but with earthquakes, no one can say for certain. In June, there was a bit of a resurgence, like it was firing back up. And it wasn't until August, I think, that we began to get the sense that, okay, it's backing off. Now we're having down to one a day or fewer, you know, May, June, July, that we're on the bubble. So we still watched it, but gradually all the other jobs we had to do began taking over and um, it just went into the background. As the level of earthquakes in Reno finally returns to normal, residents are left with a fallout of insecurity. Questions they had months ago about the nature of the swarm remain unanswered. Scientists again look to the known faults in the region to determine what caused it and why the quakes peaked at magnitude 5. We put them all on the map and then put in the, uh, the earthquakes as they've occurred. Although there isn't a fault that's directly aligned with the uh, earthquake sequence, there are some faults that are close by which are semi-parallel to it. A lot of short faults and a lot of intersecting faults. It's very complicated in the earthquake area. Um, maybe this had a relationship with all these foreshocks that occurred. Maybe a lot of little faults had to break to create the situation for the magnitude 5 to occur. And rather than set off even bigger quakes, larger faults nearby may have actually helped spare Reno from devastation. The, uh, the earthquake itself appears to be bounded by two of the larger faults. Um, and maybe this was important. Uh, the earthquake nucleated, it began the rupture. It ruptured a couple miles, uh, but it hit a weakness and stopped at that one. So maybe the, the fault pattern had a role in controlling the size of the earthquake and limiting it to a magnitude five. When scientists finally retrieve months of data from GPS units, they're stunned by what they discover. Reno's residents haven't felt it, but the ground beneath them continues to move. In the end, it turned out that the Earth moved post-seismically, that is, after the earthquake, almost three times as much as it did during the earthquake. That means more energy has been released after the earthquake than during the earthquake. But this massive release of energy was not accompanied by any strong shaking. The post-seismic motion that happened months after the earthquake is a very slow, very small movement. Uh, this is a movement of a few centimeters over months' time. So no one would feel this because it's a very slow and steady motion. This post-seismic motion is actually still going on now, a year later. And this is a significant new discovery that uh, we've made that was totally unknown. But each scientific discovery wrestled from the swarm produces more questions than answers. I think to this day we still wonder why. What exactly confined them to uh, four miles or shallower? Um, and what's going on <laughs> down below four miles? I don't know that we have a great answer for that even today. Ultimately, an earthquake is a, a release of energy. So the question becomes, how does it get stored in that shallowest few kilometers? Despite the uncertainty, what is indisputable is that all residents of Nevada must remain vigilant. We could say the swarm is over, but that does not relieve us of the responsibility to prepare for large earthquakes in this area. We could have another magnitude six earthquake in, at any time. 
the next large event in this area could come with no warning. I mean, there could be no force shocks, no ramp up. Um, it could be instantaneous. Unfortunately, as the swarm tapers off, you know, apathy creeps back in. And in some case, you know, the preparedness levels have tapered off. We don't want people to be in a constant state of paranoia, but, but we do want people to be in a constant state of readiness. Even, even to this very day, we receive earthquake alerts several a week, sometimes a couple a day. Scientists in Reno may never fully understand what happened beneath them in 2008. It's remarkable, and maybe it's a testimony to how powerful and how much energy there is stored in the Earth. It exposes our vulnerability, I think, because we, as humans, think, oh, this is solid rock and so on, and, and the Earth moves just a few centimeters, and we're terrified. But while investigations continue, the focus remains on getting Reno ready for the next time the Earth decides to attack. The message that, that we hope comes out of the earthquake swarm is that Nevada is, remains, earthquake country. As our population expands, um, you know, it, it is not a question of if we'll experience an earthquake, it's when and to what magnitude.